gentlemen, the Job of Slip Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. If you like good beer, you'll find it pays to be curious and learn about Schlitz for yourself. Now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy. Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. It's early in the evening with the spring dust settling over the campus, the vesper stillness spinning a quiet web over the great oaks and maples of Faculty Row. At the home of Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, Ivy's president and his English ex actress wife, Victoria, there's a sudden noise which shatters the car. Toddy. Uh, what is it, Victoria? You caught cold. I knew it. I've just caught it, my darling. How could you knew it? Uh, I knew it last night. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone over to the Quintanans without an overcoat. Oh, it wasn't the lack of an overcoat, Vicky. I, I'm afraid it was the overabundance of overheating in which the Quintanans revel. Only a cymbidium could survive that equatorial climate, and I am no orchid. Yes, I know. I'm afraid Mrs. Quintanan hasn't very good circulation. I'm afraid Mrs. Quintanan hasn't any blood. You thought he was an awful thing to say. Well, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't have a slight fever. I'm very fond of Mrs. Quinn Cannon, blood or no blood. Fever? You said fever? Do you really think you have? I'm going to take your temperature. I can't, let me feel your forehead. Mm -hmm. Definitely feverish. Well, a feverish reaction to your touch, Victoria, is not conclusive evidence of a pathological condition. My, my temperature always rises in direct ratio to your nearness. Well, that's very sweet of you to say so, dear. <laughs> <laughs> we mustn't let sentiment interfere with the proper treatment, oh, must oh, we? Oh, no, 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 indeed. Although, as the old joke goes, I am quite liable to take a turn for the nurse. <laughs> <laughs> you must be feverish, not downright delirious. <laughs> Have you got a busy day ahead tomorrow? Uh, loaded. Then I promise you this much, Dr. Hall. One degree about normal and all appointments are cancelled. All. Oh, nonsense. It's nothing serious. It's just a slight coriza. No, I don't know what a coriza is, but I'll take no impertinence from a patient. I'm going upstairs to get the thermometer. Well, I'll get it. Well, just tell me where it is, darling. I'll answer it if I can find it. Where it usually is, dear. It's on the bookshelf. Oh, yes, yes. Right back of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Back of it. It's the cause of it. I'll be right down. Hello, Dr. Hall speaking. Yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Nice to hear from you. Yes. Yes, I will. I plan to be home all evening. No, no, indeed. It'll be a real pleasure. Goodbye. Who was it, darling? Uh, Mr. Merriweather. What do you want? He wants you to come downstairs and stop fussing about my health. Uh, don't tease <clears throat> me, Charlie. What did he want? He wants to come over. I want you to come downstairs. What else? I want to stop yelling. My larynx is not up to it tonight. I can't find it. Not my larynx? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a moment. I can't find it anywhere. Good. Not at all. I'm going straight to the drugstore and get a new one. Well, now, you can't do that, Victoria. You wouldn't leave me alone with Mr. Merriweather. I would. And the minute I get home, I shall send him packing and tuck you into bed. One tiny little very pleasurable sneeze. And the whole world comes crashing down about my ears. One faint little sniffle and a hurricane of emotional nursing has been loose. Go, my darling, go in peace. Refurbish us with medication, hot water bottles, and all the unhappy miracles which cure mortal man of his most soothing ills. Go, while I suffer alone. <laughs> Give us some merry weather. You're cold. Stay out of the draft. I'll be right back. Uh, goodbye, Florence. Don't forget your lamp. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ah, Doctor, I do hope I'm not disturbing you. Well, on the contrary, Mr. Merriweather, I was looking forward to seeing you. Is there um, trouble on the campus? No, no, there isn't. Which is by way of being a novelty. No, Doctor, I'm not the bearer of bad news. In fact, I'm not the bearer of any news at all. Good, good. Then we can relax and discuss life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, the pursuit of happiness will do, Doctor. Life and love at my age are delicate subjects. <laughs> Uh, to be quite honest, the real reason for my visit was your wife. No. I don't think I have to remind you what a real fan of hers I am. Always have been. I know. And as president of the Victoria Cromwell Hall Fan Club, I welcome you as a member. I'll attend every meeting. Uh, doctor, I'm afraid I got a little carried away last week. You know what a hobbyist I am, always fooling around with gadgets, electric trains and stuff. I went to work at such an early age, I'm making up for my lost childhood, I guess. <laughs> you don't be surprised if I show up here sometime wearing a hop-along Cassidy suit and swinging a yo-yo. <laughs> well, you'd be quite welcome wearing a pinafore, Mr. Merriweather. But, um, what's the point? Well, the point is, Doctor, that when I learned that Mrs. Hall was going to do a number in the Junior Follies, I smuggled a recording machine into the auditorium. You did? What a splendid idea. Did you get her song? Every magnificent note of it. For posterity. And it's much too good for them. <laughs> well, I, um, I hope I can hear it sometime. I brought it with me. You did? That was very thoughtful of you. Oh, well, thanks, but in all honesty, Doctor, I must admit it was also a matter of self-preservation. Um, Mrs. Merriweather? Mrs. Merriweather. Although she's as great an admirer of Mrs. Hall as I am, she said clearly and distinctly, if you and your electric recorder play that song once more, John, I will break every bone in your large body and then sue you for divorce. Naming Thomas Alva Edison as correspondent. <laughs> She'd do it, too. <laughs> well, your danger is my good fortune, Mr. Merriweather. And um, is there any reason why we can't play it now? Oh, none at all. In fact, I'm just using your house as a safe place to play for myself. <laughs> uh, where's the floor plug? Well, right here, in back of the leather chair. Oh, fine. I'll just plug this. Oh! What the devil's the telephone doing there? Well, it's hiding. It always does. Here, I'll take it. Yeah, there we are. Now, let me turn off this lamp. Proper lighting, you know. I may be a big hulk, but I have my delicate mood. Okay. All ready, Doctor? All ready. All right. Overture. <laughs> Dynamite. 
<laughs> Wouldn't that make Rogers throw away his hammer sign? Boy? <laughs> yes, it certainly would, Mr. Merriweather. <laughs> yes, we'll we'll have to play it for Victoria. Certainly. I I wonder where on earth she can be. What time is it? Well, it's eight fifteen. Uh, why? You look alarmed. Good heavens. This has been gone more than an hour. Well, where'd she go? To the drugstore, five minutes from here. Oh, well, she probably stopped off to see someone on the way. Oh, I got to reading a magazine. There's something rather attractive about reading magazines at a drugstore's expense. <laughs> no, she, she wouldn't have done that. She thinks I'm ill. I'm not, of course, but I'm worried. We'll call in the drugstore. Yes, I will. Excuse me. Oh, now you've got me worried. Busy. Yeah, sure. When isn't it? I've always said the greatest practical joker of the 20th century was Alexander Graham Bell. I wonder if I should phone the police. Oh, no, no, don't get panicky, Doctor. Uh, you don't understand, Mr. Merriweather. She thought I was ill. She'd never stay away a minute longer than necessary. She went to get a thermometer. She thought I had a temperature. She was right, Dr. Hall. You have. You've worked yourself into a butte. I'll bet you've added more degrees to your temperature in the past five minutes than you've earned in 25 years of academic life. I was curious. I tasted it. Now I know why Schlitz is the beer that made Milwaukee famous. We'll return to the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in just a moment. But first, here's a man with a story to tell and a good reason for telling it. Before we were married, it was our favorite night spot. And it did seem the place to go on our first anniversary. As we sat down at our table by the big French window, I was humming O Lang Syne. And the waiter must have guessed that this was a special occasion for us. He winked at both of us and then disappeared before we had a chance to order. A few moments later, he was back with a smile of warm hospitality and something more. Two bottles of Schlitz beer, compliments to the management. Well, neither of us had ever tasted Schlitz, though it had been recommended to us many times. As we looked at our glasses, I knew that my wife was as curious as I. Could Schlitz really be as good as people said it was? <laughs> there was only one way to find out. So we tasted it. And I looked at my wife, and she looked at me. And I don't know whether it was mental telepathy or simply two people in complete agreement on their first anniversary. But we both said in one voice, no wonder Schlitz is the largest selling beer in America. No wonder they call Schlitz the beer that made Milwaukee famous. <laughs> vainly trying to calm a very perturbed Dr. Hall. Now, you see, Doctor, she's all right. Well, I don't understand it. The druggist said she just left there this minute. Now, what could have taken us so long to get there? Oh, any number of things. She probably stopped by to get some advice from Doc Thorson. You know what a windy old fuddy-duddy he is. Takes him 45 minutes to paint her throat. Picasso with Argero. <laughs> oh, Vicky... Vicky's too impetuous for that. I know her. She was only concerned in getting back here to take care of me. Oh, Vicky thinks advice is something that you take in, in long, slow doses when there is plenty of time and nothing else to do. She always listens to it, but I'm afraid seldom takes it. In her career in the theater, she made a fine success with that formula. I remember one night in London before we were married. I was walking backstage in her theater... And just as I approached her open broken room door, I heard a man say, Oh, Vicky, the play's doing beautifully, and you're superb in it. Then what have I done? Nothing, my dear. It's what you might do that worries me. As an old friend, I feel that I have the right to give you some advice. If you hurry, Ian, I have a date. That's what I mean. You're American. <laughs> she isn't my American. Yes. Well, let's not trouble. 
Well, I don't realize this is the basic differences between these two countries. Your habits, customs, humor, everything. They don't even speak the same language. They don't understand it. Then there's a new ambassador just appointed to bring them closer together. And I know that I speak a language at least one American will understand. So, Mrs. shouldn't have interfered. None of my business. Good luck, darling. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Good night. Good night. Hello, Ian. Oh, hello, Hall. Isn't it strange? I understood you perfectly. Every word. Good night. <laughs> Did you hear all that? Yes, I did, Victoria. I'm sorry, but I stood rooted to the spot. I didn't know the eavesdrop, dropped, but I couldn't have torn myself away. You do understand me, don't you? Uh, no, my dear, I don't. But not because we live on different sides of an ocean. Only because you're a woman. You object to that? That you're a woman? But you don't understand me. Oh, I don't object to either, my dear. And I'm particularly fond of the fact that you're a woman. <laughs> Funny how we disagree. Now, me, I'm especially glad that you're a man. Uh, do you think this conversation has any international significance? <laughs> I certainly do. How can anyone say we don't understand each other? Uh, no one with any sense could possibly say that. <laughs> Where are we going for supper? Well, I'm not sure that I'm going to feed you at all. Oh. No, a man should learn all he can about a girl under all kinds of adverse conditions, especially when she's hungry. And especially when he finds himself increasingly fond of her. Are you, William? Yes, my dear, I am. I'm very glad. You're not a bit hungry. Tell me what else a man should do when he's fond of somebody. Well, it's not easy to go on, Vicky. You see, it's the first time that this man has ever been this fond of somebody. A little overpowering. Words are hard to find. Well, uh... Action be easier? Yes, 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 they would, yes. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Well, let, let's go for a walk. Oh, no. Oh, no, of course not. You're, you're tired. Well, no, no, I, I feel wonderful. Keep talking to me. I want to hear more about words or action. Uh, Vicky. Yes, William? I've got to tell you this. I've been thinking about it every minute of the day and night. Go on, tell me. I can't leave this lovely country of yours without taking something of you away with me. Perhaps a little piece of your heart, so small that you'll scarcely miss it. I'll leave you all of mine in exchange. Boys, Miss Como, are you still in your dressing room? It's all right, Joe. I'm leaving now. Uh, who is that? The farmer making his rounds. He locks up every night and makes sure there's nothing burning. Uh, but there is something of it here. A fire that Joe will never be able to put out. <laughs> a flame that will always be burning. Of course you are, Toddy. I told you you had a fever. Fever? Oh, it's not a fever. It's much more than that. No, it's not. It's just a plain old temperature. Here's a thermometer. Fever? Thermometer? Oh, oh. Yeah, oh, yes. Yes. Open your mouth. There. Now, what have you been doing, Mr. Merriweather? Me? I've been talking like a madman for five minutes. He hasn't even answered me. Oh, I know. He's been off on one of his little daydream trips again. I think if we x-rayed his head, we'd find a little travel bureau in one corner of it. <laughs> this time, William, you didn't take me with you. Oh, I took you with me all right, my darling. But you, where have you been? You didn't take me with you. I've been at the drugstore. At the cannabis drugstore? For the length of time you were gone, I thought perhaps you, you suddenly remembered my favorite little chemist in London. Well, <laughs> sorry to have been so long, Toddy. I did run into a little trouble. What kind of trouble, ma'am? By George, if a woman like you can't get around this town without being molested. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Merriweather, it was nothing like that. This man just wanted to talk to me, so I sat in the car and he sat on his motorcycle and we uh, had a little... Uh -huh. <laughs> On his motorcycle, Victoria? A police officer? Yes, sir. He's caught. I'll break him. I'll have him transferred so far from headquarters you'll have to report by Tom Tom. <laughs> just, just a minute, Mr. Merriweather, please. You know, it, it's barely possible that my lovely wife was not entirely blameless. I take it, Vicky, my darling, that this conversation between you and the officer was not merely social. No, no. 
You see, I lived here in such a hurry, I forgot my driver's license. Well, they can't shoot you for that, Mrs. Hall. <laughs> Besides, I'm always forgetting mine. Had four photo stats made, so I'd always have one with me, and they all wind up in the same pair of pants. <laughs> the ones that are at the cleaners, usually. Uh, Vicky, how did you suspect that you didn't have your driver's license with you? He asked me for it. Mm-hmm. Just out of morbid curiosity? <laughs> no, I guess he had a reason. Did he give you a hint? He said I didn't stop at the stop sign. He uh, said? Well, William, I always stop there. At least I practically stop like everyone does. But I was rushing and I probably didn't absolutely stop. Well, I imagine that happens to all of us, Mrs. Hall. I must have read you quite a lecture to have held you up so long. Oh, he did. Well, I'm glad you're back, my dear, and I'm also glad it was no worse. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, it was a little worse. Don't tell me that this, this association with the traffic officer developed further. Well, it wouldn't have if he'd minded his own business. Uh, you are aware, of course, of the nature of his business. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I guess I was a little flustered, so after he spoke to me about the stop sign, I found myself in the middle of the block past the drugstore, and I was in a great hurry. So I made the turn. Uh, you turn? You turn? Me turn. <laughs> and when I got to the drugstore, there were so many bicycles. Now, Mr. Mike, Victoria, <laughs> what on earth have bicycles to do with this? Because the kids leave their bicycles all over the sidewalk when they go into the drugstore to read the comic book. If it's there on the sidewalk. Yes, but they're, they're sold all over, and I didn't want to scratch any of them or anything, so I just sort of drifted past them and parked the car there. Very considerate, ma'am. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. But when I came out, there was something next to the car that I hadn't noticed before. A motorcycle? On one side, yes. And on the other? A fire hydrant. <laughs> uh, taken one at a time, my dear, and adding slowly, how many citations did you get? Four. <laughs> no driver's license, stop signal, you turn and fire hydrant. Uh, don't give it another thought, Mrs. Hall. I'll have all these tickets taken care of at the City Hall tomorrow. Uh, it's very kind of you, Mr. Mayweather, but it's quite impossible. Impossible, my eye. Those boys at the City Hall know where they get the jelly for their sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayweather, yeah? I haven't the slightest doubt of your ability to handle this situation, and I appreciate your good intention. But we can't let you do it. Ethically, we must accept the penalties for transgressing the law. You think I'm being stuffy? Yes. No! <laughs> You're perfectly right. I'm sorry. I, I was very careless. Well, even so, Mrs. All, such trivial offenses. Now, Mr. Merriweather, there is no such thing as a trivial traffic violation. We work 12 months a year with the National Safety Council to give Ivy College and the town of Ivy a good traffic record. I can't preach safety and law observance and wink at violations by my own family. You're absolutely right, Toddy. I'll take the knock. The rat, Mrs. Hall. Well, I'll take the rat. Now, you, you do understand, don't you? Please? Think of our students. Driving every type of car imaginable. From chromium-plated convertibles to $25 hot rods. And none of them with the appreciation of what a ton and a half of speedy muscle can do to human flesh and bone. Because they, they haven't had time to learn the dreadful dynamics of... Speed, inertia, momentum, and impact. Well, Doctor, you, you're right, as usual. I hate to see you get stuck for all those fines, Toddy. It might really be cheaper if I went to the clink. <laughs> the best thing that ever happened to the city jail. <laughs> Raise your social tone. They've been getting a very shoddy type of patron there lately. <laughs> Well, it'll be the first time I ever paid $40 for a thermometer. <laughs> but anybody can make a mistake, Vicky. You're too intelligent to make the same one again. Yes, of course she is. I'm going home and have a little talk with my wife. 
Every time she sees a red light, she thinks, my goodness, I forgot to get the maraschino cherry. <laughs> By the way, Doctor, you mind if I leave my record player here for a day or so? No, not at all, Mr. Merriweather. May, may I use it? Oh, please do. And I hope you feel better tomorrow, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Merriweather. I am sorry to involve you in this little family contretemps. Oh, nonsense, Mrs. Hall. Perfectly natural mistake. Particularly for a woman driver. Good night, Dr. Hall. Good night. Good night. Uh, good night, and uh, Mrs. Hall, may I say that whatever your sins may be, the sight of you always makes me feel and act, I'm afraid, younger than any son of mine would have the right to. <laughs> your admirer, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Oh, Daddy. What an awful thing for me to do when you're running a campaign straight in the opposite direction. Oh, forgive the sermon, Vicky, but you do understand, don't you? Oh, of course I understand. And as for the sermon, I'm just sorry I was the one who supplied the text, Reverend. Uh, I'm a reformed character. Well, only in the matter of traffic, I hope. Otherwise, my angel, I should deplore the slightest change in any facet of your character. And I think that my cold has departed sufficiently for it to be quite safe to kiss me. You're right. It is perfectly safe. Just to make sure, let's try a little more research. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Aristot. Now, what is that machine Mr. Merriweather left here? Oh, what he calls one of his gadgets. It's a, a record player. Is there a record on it? Yes, I believe there is. Well, let's play it. Now, what have you done to deserve it? You know, the more I think of it, Toddy, it's really all your fault. My fault? Mm-hmm. If you hadn't stayed out so long in the kite flying contest, and if you had worn an overcoat to the Quintanans as I asked you to, you would never have had a cold. We wouldn't have needed a thermometer, and none of this would have happened. Uh, stop, so you can stop, stop, Vicky, stop right there. In one moment, you'll have me serving a long term in Sing Sing for a crime I didn't commit. Now... Let's play the record. But it's true, it's true, isn't it? In, in part, yes. In the main, no. Now, where's the switch? Now, but don't you think... No, 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 no more. No more. Do you remember one night in your dressing room in London, I said that I didn't understand you? Not because we lived on different sides of an ocean, simply because you're a woman. Do you love me? Now, how does this thing start? Oh, here we are. I've got it. Do you, do you love me? Completely, eternally, I surrender unconditionally. And now I'm speaking. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Colvin. Good night, everyone. Good night. Watch for Ronald Colvin's latest picture, Champagne for Caesar, which will be released nationally next week. We'll be seeing you next week at this time at the Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Colvin. The other players were Willard Walkerman and Eric Snow. Tonight's script was written by Matt Wolf and Don Quinn. Our music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. The Halls of Ivy was created by Don Quinn, directed by Matt Wolf, and presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing.